Hello. Welcome. Hey, my name is Lin Sun. I'm the moderator for this session. I work for a small company, Solo.io. We specialize in application networking. We still have some spaces up front if you are brave enough to walk on the first row, second row. So um, please welcome Aaron to um, present to us seeing is believing debugging with ephemeral containers. All right. Thank, Thank you. you Okay, let's get going here. Uh, so, um, see if I can make this work. Oh, a little ahead, of, getting a little ahead of myself here. There we go. Make sure uh, PowerPoint's going to do what I need to do. Okay, so I'm going to be talking about uh, ephemeral containers uh, today. Of course, uh, I'm Aaron Alpar. Uh, I work with Casten. Uh, software engineer with Casten. Uh, I do software engineering sort of stuff. I, I f primarily focus on the uh, uh, the data layer persistence. Um, so uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, ephemeral containers. So and what's important about ephemeral containers is that the they are more than just containers that stick around for just a little while. They're uh, a very important piece to uh, Kubernetes architecture. Uh, I'm going to give you a little bit of that and uh, hopefully uh, reasons why, as well as a lot of the technical background that makes ephemeral containers work. And hopefully by seeing that technical background, uh, you'll get an understanding of what their power is. Um, so anyhow. Uh, so let me proceed. Uh, this is going to be a pretty technical presentation. So I, I encourage you to download the slides. Uh, they're up on Sketch for this. Uh, I just happened to update them about a half an hour ago. So if you've already downloaded them, try to download them again. The content remains largely the same. So uh, the ordering of a few of the slides, and I've emphasized some details in the new ones. So if you're following along, I encourage you, definitely encourage you to download the slides. Uh, I've got a lot of console-y type text in here, a couple of slides. Uh, the fonts are small, so I'm hoping that uh, folks can see them. Yet another reason uh, to download the presentation. Uh, anyhow, let me get started. Um, before I get started about talking about ephemeral containers, I'm going to talk about what, you, what you're going to need in this presentation. This presentation is, a, uh, is uh, both me presenting and talking about it. Uh, as well as a sort of self-driven tutorial. So I'll talk about that as we go along. Uh, to, make this, to make this tutorial work, uh, you're going to need, uh, and this, this is designed to do after the presentation. Uh, I don't try to follow along while I'm talking because we've only got 30 minutes and it could go pretty quickly. Uh, I'm using Kind in this presentation. Kind is a, a local cluster. Uh, the reason why I'm using Kind is because I'm going to need direct access to the node, and I'll basically use, uh, need privilege access to the node. So the easiest way for me to do this is to start up a local cluster. Uh, in this case, I'm using Kind, which happens to be what Kubernetes uses for their own testing. Uh, it's fairly featureful, and it will certainly do the trick uh, for our presentation. It does use a Docker, so there's implied uh, that you'll need Docker installed to make this work. Uh, I think that's pretty standard at this point. Uh, I'm going to also be using Postgres. Postgres just happens to be an open source uh, application that I can install with Helm. It doesn't really matter uh, what you use. Uh, but the examples I'm going to be using are uh, going to be using Postgres. Okay. Uh, so the, you're going to see a bunch of slides that look like this. So uh, and the blue, there, see the dollar sign there? That is a command prompt. Uh, that's in bold right next to it. Blue text. That is something you can copy and paste into a shell. And you should get output that looks a little bit like the gray text that follows it. So voila. Uh, so this is uh, the, my command uh, to create a kind cluster. Just type that in, kind, create cluster. It'll uh, go about its business and create a new local cluster for you. Uh, after you've got a new local cluster installed, you can install uh, Helm. So uh, this is a command to install Helm. I use Bitnami repos. Uh, 
uh, it's in there, uh, create a namespace for it, and then use Helm 3 to install that. Uh, at that point, you should kind of be all set. You got kind installed, you got Postgres installed. Uh, you might want to check your versions uh, just to make sure that you've got uh, the correct stuff installed. I am uh, running with bleeding edge. This is another reason to use kind is that you can get the latest, uh, latest versions of uh, Kubernetes as, uh, as well as, of course, kube control be compatible with that. Uh, then I can go ahead, make sure I've got my pods running. Postgres will run with a single pod. Okay. So you're all set up. Uh, so now for ephemeral containers. So ephemeral containers are new. They're beta in one, two, three. Uh, this means that if you install Kubernetes uh, 123, uh, they will be enabled by default. So you're not going to have to set any feature gates or anything like that, which is nice. Uh, all of the platforms, as far as I know, have uh, uh, 123 on their edge release. So if you want to get, if you want to play around with e uh, ephemeral containers on something like GKE or what have you, uh, uh, either it'll just be installed by default or go take a look at the edge releases and you should be able to find it for uh, installation. Uh, it should be fairly straightforward. So. With all this, ephemeral containers start with debugging. These are the cases that you'll primarily see on all example sites for ephemeral containers, and a vast majority of the literature that's out there is about debugging using ephemeral containers. So I'm going to start with that. I'm going to talk just a little bit about uh, debugging uh, in general in Kubernetes, uh, very high level, and then I'm going to do a deep dive into ephemeral containers, and not so much the process of actually debugging your uh, programs, but the stuff that makes debugging work. Uh, and I'll get into a few examples. So uh, there's, again, there's a lot of implications that go far beyond debugging with ephemeral containers. Okay, so uh, this is debugging by attaching. Pro hopefully everybody's familiar with this. Uh, this is where uh, you might have a pod that's uh, having problems. Uh, and you're, you've uh, deployed this pod with like a Debian release or maybe even a Red Hat release, and you just shell into it directly, and you run commands and you try to figure out what's going on. Uh, here, here's an example of doing that. Da -da -da. Uh, kubectl exec, uh, and uh, we just run a, a bin, sh bin shell or what have you in the pod, so we can go ahead and log in and debug, debug into it. Uh, this is, uh, so you can debug by attach or uh, you can debug by copy, which I'm not sure everybody really knows about, uh, but this is using the actual debug command. Uh, it allows you to take a create a copy of your pod. So pods are the smallest unit of, unit of scheduling, right? So uh, with the current infrastructure, what you have to do if you want to run a new process in a pod, other than executing into it, is that you're going to have to create a copy of it with a new container um, or with whatever debugging tools, a new image or de whatever debugging tools that you want. Uh, so this is debugging by copy. And what this does is it creates a copy of the container and it runs that. It's a little awkward, but it works. Um, if you don't know about it, I encourage you to look it up. So, uh, so debugging without ephemeral containers, so we can either attach, which I covered, uh, which we, we can either copy, which I also covered, um, uh, but this, this is a little, it's, if you debug by attaching, it means you need to include all of your debugging tools in your container so you can attach to it. If you want to change that container to include additional tools, uh, you're going to have to copy it. And uh, uh, this requires doing some uh, foo magic uh, on your workloads to make that work. So like if you're working with a deployment or you're working with a stateful set, uh, it, it's, you're gonna make a copy of the pod and then the, the stateful set's gonna look at it and see that its replicas have changed and then it's gonna start up another pod and you're gonna have to set your services to point at the right pod. Anyhow, it's a little bit of a mess, but you can, you, once you get the hang of it, it works. Um, ephemeral containers get around this uh, and I'll talk a little bit about this. 
Uh, this is how you debug by ephemeral container. So you've got Kubernetes 1.2.3 installed by kind. You've got Postgres in there as my previous example. Uh, copy and paste that command in there, and what you get is an ephemeral container, um, uh, BusyBox, standard set. Uh, so this, this is a, it actually runs a new container. The pod stays the same, a new container is added to it, which is really handy. Uh, this is a little bit of a, a little bit of a special container. It's probably not going to be obvious uh, immediately because all containers within a pod get to share the same network resources. So, uh, so anyhow, by default, uh, you'll see network resources shared. Uh, that's that's uh, really nice. Uh, and uh, this is this is an ideal case for doing more complicated debugging. Uh, and as we'll see, we can get really we can get really complex. Um, we can get really complex with the debugging, not just simply uh, network resources. Um, so here we go again. Here's another example of debugging with ephemeral containers. Again, you can copy and paste this. Uh, you see the usual prompts. You know, if you don't see a prompt, hit enter. Da 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 da. Now, uh, when you're looking at the pod. Uh, the pod resource, the pod spec, things are going to change. So I want to talk a little bit about what it actually looks like in the pod after you've executed an uh, ephemeral container. And then I'll kind of revisit this and talk about it again later on. Uh, so this is the ephemeral container spec. So I've, I've run the previous command, boom. Uh, and what I get is a new ephemeral container. That'll be evident in the, po in the pod spec. Uh, here's the ephemeral container spec. So I'm going to go ahead and get the pod as YAML. And down here, I know the font is small. I'll blow it up in a second. Uh, we have a spec. Uh, we have our containers there. And we have a new, we, uh, we have a new uh, property, ephemeral containers. Uh, this is a zoom in whoop, uh, to that. And uh, again, here we see it. Uh, so this lists all of my ephemeral containers, for which I have one now. Uh, so that's executing. Uh, there's another important part of this, and if I get it again and I look through it, and again, I blow it up. Uh, we also, on the status uh, property, the spec, uh, I also get an ephemeral container entry. So we get two new entries in the resource, the YAML, uh, for the resource. Uh, one is just regular ephemeral containers that, uh, that tell us what, what, sh what ephemeral container should be started. Uh, and then I have the status end, which gives me the current status of the ephemeral containers. So, uh, so I, I, I'm I'm set. I can debug with ephemeral containers. I know what the I know what to look for on the spec, so I can see what the status is of ephemeral containers. See which ephemeral containers are running. And again, this the spec is changed on the pod uh, as it's running, which is unique. That's one of the things that's really nice about ephemeral containers. Uh, but what is ephemeral container? So this is actually going to be a majority of the presentation. Uh, and I'm going to try to spend some time on this. Um, uh, uh, a container can be thought of as sandbox, right? So you're in the sandbox, you're executing commands, and what you can see is limited. You can't see the entire system. You can't see into other pods, right? You can't really see into other containers, actually. Uh, you're you're in a you're basically you're in a container. It can be uh, seen as a sandbox. What makes this work is Linux namespaces. So now these are not Kubernetes namespaces. These are Linux namespaces. They've got namespace in the name. They're they're rather different. Um, so I'm going to talk about Linux namespaces in this. Um, so Linux namespaces c control container isolation. Linux namespaces are the things that uh, don't allow you to see outside of the container into the rest of the system. So you can play with these namespaces so you can see various parts of other containers. So it's really nice. And th this, this is really what ephemeral containers are about, is controlling Linux namespaces. Um, I'll talk a little bit about this. There are, many, uh, there are many namespaces. Here's just a few. Mount, PID, these are, these are roughly listed in the order of importance. Uh, 
uh, Mount PID, Net, IPC, there's a bunch of them. Uh, there's some resources at the end. I'm gonna talk about these and there's some resources at the end and I'll talk about those too. Uh, each, each namespace is identified by an uh, inode. So these are, these are kind of those funny file system things. So uh, it, they, there's an inode in the file system. It's a virtual file system uh, that represents these. Uh, I'm gonna talk about the PID namespace, the mount namespace, and the net main namespace. I think those are probably the ones that you're most worried about. And there's also some quirks in there that you should know about uh, when you start to play around with these. Um, so, uh, as I said before, you're going to need to, you're going to need privilege access to the node to make this work. And here's an example of this. So what I'm doing here is, uh, is one of my first examples of Linux namespaces is that, uh, I'm going to, uh, log in, uh, to the, uh, control plane node. Uh, this is the, basically the only, when you use kind, it is the only node you got by default. Um, and I'm going to take a look at the namespaces for PID1. PID1, of course, is the init. Um, and uh, I can see those uh, by ls-l slash proc. Everybody should know what slash proc is. Uh, one, which is PID1. And then for each process in, in proc, uh, there's an ns. Uh, and under the ns directory, you'll see all the namespaces listed out. Uh, over here, do 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 on the left, um, uh, we've got, uh, or the right rather, uh, we've got a listing of inode entries uh, with their corresponding namespaces that they, uh, they're associated with. So that is in proc for the process. Under the NS directory, you'll see a bunch of files, and those are all related to namespaces. Uh, I can get access to those uh, if I have a privileged shell on the node. Uh, here's, a, here's one of those zoom-ins again. Uh, this first entry, by the way, that's going to come up later on. So just keep it in the back of your head. Uh, but these are the namespaces for PID1. Uh, so now if I, if I, that's from the node perspective. Uh, what I can do is uh, I can go in and do the same thing and take a look at uh, my Postgres processes that are running on the node. So that's, sorry, the previous slide was from the init perspective. This is taking a look at Postgres, which is running in a, running in a container uh, within the, the Kubernetes cluster. So here I uh, get my PID for Postgres. Uh, I PS it as an example. And then here what I do is I get all of the namespaces for Postgres. And I can list all of those out. Now these are the namespaces that the container is actually going to use to run Postgres in. And here's a zoom in of that as well. Uh, the identifiers for this aren't so important, and I'll, I'll, uh, we'll see more of this in just a second. So those are how you see namespaces. You can, you can look in proc. You can see which namespaces are identified with which process. In the example that I had before, we looked at PID1. Uh, and then we looked at our, our Postgres uh, namespaces for our Postgres process. Those will come up in just a second. Uh, looking at them doesn't do you much good. Uh, what you really want to be able to do is execute something uh, with a certain set of namespaces set. Uh, this is what a command called nsenter does. It allows you to enter a set of namespaces and execute commands as though you were in that namespace. So when you're in a container, this is really what you're doing is uh, running a shell with NSenter so your perspective on the system changes according to what namespaces you'll see. This is an example of running NSenter. Uh, I'm here, I'm gonna run NSenter in the Postgres namespace uh, specifically for network. So NSenter dash dash network and then I give it uh, a namespace file in proc that says uh, start up a command uh, using uh, whatever namespace, the, using the network namespace for whatever Postgres is using. Uh, and here I just run sstcp-l uh, just to see uh, what's listening. And here we go. Uh, if I want, it's, it's a little tedious to list out all of the namespaces that you, you want to use. Uh, so there's a shorthand, it's called target, 
Uh, target uh, basically allows you to give it a PID and it will enter the namespace of that process. It's really handy. So if you have a shell somewhere or you have some sort of command and you wanna see the universe from the viewpoint of that process, this is how you do it. Uh, you specify a target, give it a PID, uh, dash dash all, and then da da, run your command. Uh, so, I'm gonna show you uh, what, what things, what doing this looks like uh, from the node, executing uh, being in a namespace versus what it looks like from the container. So, uh, here's a kubectl exec. Uh, here I'm, uh, I'm execing a command in the, in the default container in my pod, right? So, ps ef I just wanna see what the processes are. Um, so, here I go, ps ef uh, oh, excuse me, those are the processes, uh, this should look familiar. And this is the view that we get if I exec directly into the node and then uh, I do an NS enter, give it a target of my Postgres process and uh, I do a PS-EF, basically the same thing. You'll notice if I switch between these two slides, the output is basically exactly the same. So this, uh, the NS enter command basically is the same, as I said before, is the same thing as running within a, a, a container in a pod. So this tells you that uh, basically these are, this is essentially the same system that your node uses to build up containers. Okay, so. That's sort of the background. I'll get into some more details. And again, a little bit like that blue, the blue text I was telling you about and entering in that. I'm gonna use this comparison technique of uh, moving between slides uh, in a few cases to show you what, 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 the, what changes when you do uh, certain commands. Uh, so, ephemeral containers. Uh, uh, when you start in ephemeral containers, Network namespace is shared by default, really handy. There's a bunch of other namespaces that are uh, also shared. This is certainly the most important, I think. Uh, you can share other namespaces. So you can kind of tweak things and change your perspective uh, from, the, uh, from the container. So um, here's a namespace uh, when debugged by attaching. So this, I'm gonna go directly into the Postgres node and uh, I'm gonna go, go ahead and do an ls-l self ns. So a self, if you haven't heard of that, uh, is just whatever the current process is. So I'm in a container, I'm just doing a PS. Um, now I'm doing this next command is a, a kubectl debug. So this is, a con uh, this is a, an ephemeral container debug, right? Uh, again, into Postgres. So before, this is like execing into the container and running a command. Uh, this is uh, uh, starting a uh, ephemeral debug container uh, against the same pod and against the same uh, container. So, uh, so here I go ahead and start it, uh, ephemeral container with an image of BusyBox. This will uh, start a, uh, this will start a new container uh, there it is, defaulting debug container name to debug, blah, 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 blah. Uh, we get the usual thing, press enter. Um, and if I do that same command, I pretty much get the same output, but a few things have changed. Uh, so what I get is I get a, a, a set of new namespaces. And what's highlighted in yellow is, are the, the namespaces that change. So when I start a new ephemeral container within the pod, uh, I share all the same resources in that pod uh, with the exception of C groups, my mount, my PID, and my PIDs, right? So when I PID in my container, I'm gonna, when I do an ls-l or something like that, uh, I'm gonna see my own set of processes, right? Uh, when I look at my mount points or when I look at my file systems, I'm gonna see my own files. Uh, C groups has to do with permissions. I'll talk about it a little bit in a, in a minute. But as you can see, my net, the, between the two yellow things right there, my net namespace remains the same. So when I do like an SS or an IF config or something like that, I'm gonna see the same network resources as the rest of the pod would normally see. Um, there's time, and not so important. 
Uh, the bottom one for user namespace is actually pretty important, uh, which means you're going to be sharing the user namespaces of the pod. So the user IDs uh, that you're going to see are going to be the same as what you would get in just all the other containers in the pod. So this is by default. Um, what I can do is, opposed to just starting up a, a, a ephemeral container, the default container, is I can uh, set up a specific target container. Uh, so here we're doing a kubectl debug, da 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 da, uh, and I'm specifying a target, target Postgres. That is basically the same format that you used in NSender, right? Dash dash target, and you gave it a process. That's kind of what we're doing here. So. Notice here that uh, fewer of my namespaces have changed. So this means I'm sharing more uh, with the original pod. And what's most important is now you're sharing the PID namespace with the pod. Uh, excuse me, you're sharing the PID namespace with the Postgres container, which is very helpful. So all of a sudden when you go into this container, you're going to see all of the same processes uh, that your target container is in your target container. And largely, the view of the world uh, through your uh, ephemeral container will look just as if you were logged into that target container Postgres. Uh, so, uh, ephemeral containers uh, versus uh, kubectl execing. Kubectl execing in into uh, a pod or into a container, uh, you, will, you will basically see all the resources in that container, but you'll be limited uh, by uh, mounts, uh, that is by the tools that are available in that container. So uh, the, the files will change. Um, you will get network namespaces in IPC and UTS and so on and so forth by default, which is great. Uh, it's very handy for doing the regular network debugging. So you can share the PID namespace uh, by using target. I'll talk a little bit about that more. Um, so let me talk a little bit about uh, ephemeral, uh, ephemeral containers and uh, how to get access to more. So. Uh, uh, we, you may want to get access, for example, to file system mounts and a few other things, uh, and I'll talk about that. So ephemeral containers uh, are a sub-resource. Technically, uh, they're uh, basically a new resource off of pods. It is, a, it is now a sub-resource. So if you want to address uh, uh, ephemeral containers uh, using API calls, you're going to have to use sub-resources which means that you're going to have to use raw or you're going to have to use custom uh, API calls. Um, I talked about this before. Uh, every time you run an ephemeral container, it shows up in the ephemeral container pros, uh, property, and the, uh, the statuses, the dynamic statuses, uh, exit codes, and so on and so forth for those containers is uh, listed in ephemeral container status. Oh, yes, unique names must be used. Uh, I'll talk about that a little bit more in just a second. Uh, here's a handy uh, command for listing out ephemeral containers. Da 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 da, I get all my ephemeral containers and I get all my ephemeral container statuses. Um, as I said before, not all properties are available from kubectl. You can uh, 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 run kubectl exec. Uh, to start up ephemeral containers, but there are some namespaces that you don't have access to from the command line. Um, there's, there's mounts and uh, mounts, excuse me, mounts, PIDs, and something else not coming to mind. Regardless, we'll see that in a second. Uh, oh, yes, you cannot remove or change ephemeral containers uh, or ephemeral container statuses. So you'll see this uh, once you try to access the sub-resource directly. Uh, you can add ephemeral containers. You cannot remove ephemeral containers. Now, remember that every time you start an ephemeral container, uh, it's added to the ephemeral containers uh, in the pod and the ephemeral container statuses. This means as you start ephemeral containers, uh, it, they, you will get, the more ephemeral containers you start against the pod, the greater, the longer that list will be uh, of ephemeral containers. So. And I'm running a little short on time. I'm almost at the end of the presentation, so I think it's going to work out well. Uh, so this is an example of a custom API call to create an ephemeral container. Uh, 
Um, in my case, uh, I do not have access to volume mounts uh, uh, using the regular kubectl debug uh, command line. So this is an example of how you do that. Uh, one, since it's a container, you have access to all of the volumes in the pod. So what I can do here is uh, do a custom API call, create a custom uh, uh, ephemeral container with a mount uh, to create to access my mounts. Now, there's a good reason why ephemeral containers don't allow you just to mount uh, the copy over the mount namespace of the pod is because the proc, uh, the proc mount is an important mount, and that affects the rest of the system. So you have to be choosy about which file systems you mount. And that's why you can't just go ahead and share the mount main namespace. And if you like, I encourage you to play around with it because you'll get some interesting results. Um, but regardless, you'll have to pick and choose your mounts. This is one way to do it. Um, this is an example of uh, this is an example of uh, the once again the comparison of the uh, namespaces uh, between uh, the 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 mount uh, the. Uh, blah, excuse me, the ephemeral container I just started with a new mount. Notice we get a new net mount namespace. So it's basically uh, the same as I had before when I started ephemeral container by default. But I created a, a brand new namespace so I can mount my volume mount uh, that's in the pod. So that's useful. Uh, here's uh, taking a look at uh, some of the mounts that I have. Da -da -da. There's my new mount slash mount. Uh, and I can go ahead and I can list that, voila, the files are there. So uh, if I can mount, if I can do custom mounts, uh, then I have access to some of the data that's in my pod. Uh, once you do that, uh, you can start talking about uh, doing uh, really interesting debugging. Uh, and there's also a privilege mode that allow you to do even more interesting debugging. Uh, so after you've gotten, uh, um, been able to do your own mounts, uh, been able to get access to the network namespace, be able to get access to the PID namespace, and uh, for some things, getting access to the uh, privilege namespace, uh, which I'll talk about in a second, you can do some very interesting debugging. If you haven't already heard about this, it's called NetShoot. Uh, it's a container that's specifically designed for debugging. Uh, it, you can start it up as a, a, just a regular old container, but its utility is very limited uh, as that. Once you start using it as a ephemeral container, the, its, its utility really uh, becomes evident. Uh, so it's a system-level diagnostic container. It contains uh, tools like strace, ltrace, tcp dump, what have you. Uh, it's very nice. Um, so this is an example of starting up a container using NetChute uh, as a privileged container. So I'm skipping a few steps here, uh, but that's okay. So here I'm, along with my volume mounts, I'm adding a security context uh, and setting privilege to true. So this is basically running this container as root. Even though uh, the, the container I'm debugging is not a privileged container, I can run an ephemeral container as a privileged container. Here I'm going to run NetChute, and then when I do that, I can do all sorts of interesting things on my target container that you'd never be able to do in a regular container. Uh, in this case, I can run strace, for instance. So I can, look at, uh, I can look at system calls that are executing. I can look at all the network resources. Uh, if you've got the mount set up, you can take a look at the data, that's the, data the changes in data that your target container is, do, uh, is making uh, to the file system. So it gets uh, uh, pretty, uh, pretty complete at that point. Um, here I'm going to do a similar... Uh, I'm going to do a similar comparison here. Here's my classic kubectl exec. Excuse me. Here's my classic kubectl exec. So this is from slide 40. Uh, this is when I logged in uh, originally to the pod to just see all the, the, see, all the uh, see all the namespaces as if you had just exec into it. This is the one uh, using my privilege container, debug container two. 
there you see those two, uh, those two new namespaces, the C group namespace and the mount namespace. Take a look at that C group namespace. That happens to be the same namespace as PID1 in that original example in slide 30. So C groups uh, control permissions. So that is the namespace. Uh, I, I, can, I think of namespaces as being what you can see and C groups as ba basically being the dials, right? So here, uh, we're sharing the same control as PID1 uh, basically in that pod. So that's what a privileged container is for. Yeah, yeah, I see, yeah, we're, we're, doing, we're doing good. Uh, yep. Yeah. Um, so that's, so with all of that, um, given that you can get complete access to your pods uh, through ephemeral containers uh, to the point of having access to uh, 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 the basically privileged, privileged access, I encourage you to look into C groups. Uh, this allows us to talk about distro lists. So uh, distro lists is when you deploy containers that only contain the application that you're gonna wanna run. They don't contain any of the utilities. So with ephemeral containers, you can start to start containers beside uh, your application containers with commands like ls and ps and what have you. And given that you can have up to, you know, this sort of privileged access to the pod, you can then run those commands against the containers just as if you were in the container itself. So this loosens the requirement that you have all the tools required to debug or even really use your containers and spec files within the, within the containers themselves. So, so that is basically it. Uh, here's a list of resources. I, I encourage you to take a look at these guys. Uh, they're, they're fairly valuable and they're pretty comprehensive in terms of C groups, which is the next important topic, uh, which I didn't have time to cover, uh, as well as what makes containers work and some of the intentions behind uh, ephemeral containers beyond simply debugging. So I'll open it up for questions. I think I've got just a few more minutes. Yay, yeah. thank you so much, Aaron. Okay. That was a great explanation. I think we, uh, we probably have time to take one question. I don't see any questions online, so I'm going to walk to the gentleman. Hello, uh, I'm just missing a piece from your presentation. What happens to the ephemeral container once you're done debugging? Uh, it, it, it remains as an entry in the pod. Uh, it goes away. You get an exit code and the st once, so the question is, what happens to an ephemeral container once it's done? Uh, if you exit an ephemeral container, the entry remains listed in the pod. Nothing you can do about that. You will see an exit status within the ephemeral container statuses that says, you know, was it, whether it exited with a code of one or zero. You can get some log information from it, which is handy. If you opened a terminal to that ephemeral container, if you attempt to attach to it using kubectl attach, you'll actually get the last screen you saw. Uh, so it, that it's kind of a double-edged sword. It allows you to see any errors, last errors that were output, but at the same time, if somebody has access to kubectl attach, they could see some sensitive information that might be listed there. Thank so, you. Uh -huh. Oh, and once you restart the pod, the ephemeral containers will go away and you get to start over from scratch. Okay, with that, uh, let's thank Aaron again for a wonderful presentation. Good job.